Pedro for a Q and he only went over five minutes. So that's excellent time. I, I do want to just note uh, something that we had talked about earlier when uh, the landing site was changed from Trinidad. Trinidad was actually a very, very good choice, close to the Escambray Mountains. Um, the city was uh, an area where there had been a lot of anti-Castro activity and so on and so forth. So it would have been a very, very good site. The change to the Bay of Fakes that was done very quickly had all kinds of problems, and obviously it was not an ideal, and I know Pedro had that in his notes, and uh, uh, I wanted to add that. But basically, just to summarize, and I'll open it up for question, uh, the points of the major mistakes. First, a ceiling was established, which meant that the operation had to look a certain way, meant that the equipment was not necessarily the best equipment, and so on and so forth. Second, the changing of the landing site from Trinidad, which would have been a very good site and had uh, the ability to retreat to the, to the mountains if necessary. And finally, of course, the critical mistake of not controlling the air by Kennedy canceling the uh, airstrikes in the nation. So with that, I would really like to open it up for, for, for questions uh, from Diego. I have two uh, brief comments uh, and a question connected to them. Uh, you made a very, very good point, Pedro, with the, uh, with the uh, cover story. Uh, would have, have not been given the, uh, the proper emphasis. However, I will remind you of this, because this is something that has never been mentioned. It's only been in a book that Brian didn't like very much, came out last year, in by Jim Rasenberg. And I think this is crucial. I think this is a whole, the whole thing. I have talked to many of the brigade participants, including uh, Felix Rodriguez, to whom I asked this question directly last year. They all knew, they all knew, they must have known, but they also knew very well that there was no way, it was impossible for 1,200 men to defeat at least 30,000 well-armed and trained soldiers from Cuba, plus 200,000 militiamen. So how could they possibly win? Only one way, and it's in here. It's in the first briefing that Kennedy received on January the 28th. This is only in Rosenberg's book. Never found it anywhere else. Well, I knew this. I always knew it. Finally found it. This is what the reports said. Very briefly, just two lines. <coughs> this was read to Kennedy. Kennedy was there. Kennedy didn't say anything at all about this crucial two lines here. It ended. The CIA believes that the president's plan can establish a beachhead in Cuban territory and keep it for a period of two weeks, possibly up to 30 days. Once this has been attained, there will be a base for, it, for, a, for an open initiative by the U.S. to institute a military occupation of the island, preferably by forces that would include Amer Latin America from the uh, Organization of American States. There is an oppor a reasonable opportunity that the success of the uh, described plan can cause an operation inside Cuba. This was straight to Kennedy. He heard it. He didn't say anything. He did order the Pentagon to review the Trinidad plan. And then, of course, you know what happened. Mm -hmm. But this is this is totally important. This was the whole thing. Now I did ask Brian, I don't know if you remember, last year at the seminar, if there was any conceivable way that you could see that Kennedy, not Eisenhower, not if Nixon had won, for Kennedy to have approved US forces to land in Cuba. And you said what? Okay, let's uh, That's the question then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I uh, I said then I'll say it again, Diego. That uh, no, Kennedy was adamantly opposed to using American military in Cuba at the Bay of Pigs and in the missile crisis, and until he died, 
He was adamantly opposed. He said so repeatedly in press conferences and in, in other official statements. And it's important to understand why he was so opposed. He was opposed because he was, he was very fearful of a nuclear conflict with the Soviet Union that, uh, that any military action against Cuba would, would spark. He was very worried about Berlin. He was very worried about the vulnerability of West Berlin to the, to the Soviet armies that surrounded it in, uh, in East Germany. Uh, he, uh, he was very concerned about something that he had initiated a month before the Bay of Pigs. It was called the Alliance for Progress. It was his progressive program for working with uh, all, of the, all of the other Latin American countries to induce, promote, and support economic, social, and even political reform. Uh, it was a very, the Alliance for Progress was a very idealistic and altruistic program. It was modeled on the Marshall Plan that was so successful in Western Europe after World War II. And Kennedy wanted to repeat those same, uh, those same accomplishments in Latin America. And had he sent military force into Cuba in April, a month after he started the Alliance for Progress, it would have, uh, it would have completely shattered all, all, of, all of his hopes to present himself in Latin America as an idealist. But at the he same was not going yeah. to use military force. Excuse me, but let me just... No, the second point, and then you can answer. Mm -hmm. The second point is for you. I want you to, the two of you to finally see if you can put to rest the false accusation that Stevenson was the one responsible for the, for the, for the uh, bombing to be canceled. It was not. Stevenson had nothing to do with it. You, you are absolutely right. right. Okay, I want you to no, no, You are absolutely right. And, and what I mentioned, what, what Stevenson says, he felt like a fool in front of the whole world. He was lying. He actually, he was called a liar. With proof, they showed the pictures. The one that began the motion was Dean Russell. And I mentioned him several times because he might have been, and uh, this other investigation had to be done, and maybe Brian would like to, to enter into that, but it, Dean Rusk was the one that proposed the change from, to, from Casilda, and he was the one, according to information that I received, that called Kennedy and says to Kennedy, Dean Rusk is threatening to resign. Dean Rusk, Stevenson. Stevenson, I'm sorry. Nobody knows if Stevenson ever says that, but this is the information that the president received. And, and, and basically this is, this is the, make it clear. But, <coughs> no, it happened, I just forgot to I, was I, uh, I wanted to say a few words in behalf of Dean Rusk. He, uh, Rusk, well, you know, I, I just try to speak from the facts, not, uh, Rusk was the longest serving Secretary of State in modern American history. I think the longest since Cordell Hull. He served a full eight years in Kennedy and Johnson terms. Uh, Dean Rusk, when he, entered, uh, when he entered the State Department, had very little compatibility with Jack and Bobby Kennedy. They didn't like him. And Kennedy, Kennedy insisted that he was going to be his own Secretary of State. He really didn't need a Secretary of State. He just wanted a bureaucrat there in Foggy Bottom to manage the department, but he didn't have much respect for Rusk. And Rusk knew that. And Rusk was very reluctant in April uh, when, when Kennedy was you know, soliciting the advice of his counselors. Rusk was very reluctant to speak up because he knew that he did not have the President's ear. In his memoirs, which are, which are worth reading, Rusk uh, castigates himself harshly. He says, I should, have, I should have taken a more forceful stand. And yes, he should have. Instead of abstaining. But I, was, I would like to well, mention... Make, make clear that the more forceful stand would be to have canceled the operation. Yeah, I want to okay. give another yeah. no, opportunity. Just, yeah. to, I just want to mention this yeah, on, here, on right. Dean Rusk. Here, here, here. Uh, Dean, have... Dean Rusk. Dean Rusk, his experience in World War II, was on the Burma 
close to India area. And there, the airplanes, the Air Force, did not play the relevant roles that it plays in other theaters of operation during World War II. Therefore, his mind somehow was not geared to the huge importance of the airplanes in modern warfare. Diego is also a historian, so there's always a danger that we end up here with filibusters instead of questions. <laughs> so I have a question here, then, then Eduardo, then here, and then Marielina, okay? Excuse me. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Connor as well. So I'm, I'm, I'll try to get to all of you. Give me a second. Assuming that the variables had stayed the same, that is, that the battle plan would have continued favor, favoring a conventional landing as opposed to a, something to, to strengthen the guerrillas and the Esprit. Assuming that that battle plan had stayed the same constant, to what extent would the outcome have been different if this had been an October 1961 landing, giving enough giving time for disaffection to grow in Cuba? That's six months, eight months. You're talking October 61. 61. Well, the um, the concern the concern in the concern in CIA and in the administration was that Castro's military forces were rapidly being bolstered and uh, built up by the Soviets. Especially mixed, the mix were coming, the pilot, the pilot, uh, mixed pilots were coming to Cuba within a few days. It may, it may, it yeah. wasn't, it may. So you're talking three, four, five weeks. The, so that, that, that's the reason why they could not wait any longer. Okay, I got three of the, uh, Orlando? Just one aspect that hasn't been touched is the aspect of the underground. Uh, there was a large underground in Cuba at that time, and, and the CIA apparently did not trust the, the underground, and they were never informed when the invasion was to take place. So what happened when two days before the invasion, the, 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 the military attack the, the, of the planes took place, the whole underground was, was taken prisoner, and they, they had to, and, and so what happened when, at the time of the invasion, rather than blowing bridges and so on and so forth, they were all uh, neutralized. And that was an important factor in, in the defeat of, uh, of the Bay of Pigs invasion, in my estimation. And that is absolutely correct. I was part of that underground <coughs> and started having to run for, from house to house in hiding because we had no idea at that time. Dr. Connor? Yes. I'm going to ask a question that I have never asked about Bay of Peaks, and it's related to a very personal situation. I was married at the time to Pedro Vicente Aja, who was very connected to the groups in Miami, and he revealed to me after the invasion failed that he was supposed to go with a group to form a junta in the oriental part of the island. Why would they, how could they do that if these information you have communicated here that Kennedy never would have established really, I mean, if, if they hadn't invaded with their, with their, with the army, with the American army, with the Latin American army, and established the situation in a way that they could defend that junta. Because a thousand and, and some hundred, you know, uh, invasion fighters could not hold I have, it. I had so, so, is that true or not? Well, the answer is. Do you know it? The answer, I will tell you the answer by one of the planners, Greystone Leach. I <laughs> interviewed him in Tampa. I actually went with some of his. Of his very close friend. The microphone, please. I interviewed him in Tampa. Who? Uh, Grayson Lynch, which was one of the CIA planners. Oh, okay. And they they believe that they could hold the Trinidad area for the times that it was mentioned, for the two or three weeks. They did believe that according to the tactical topography, with the mountains on one flank, the sea on the other, 
and, and uh, many reasons that we won't enter, that they believed that there was a good chance. And second, if they, con they had controlled the air, they I'm would sorry, have... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They would have... They would have created havoc on the Castro's approaching forces. Those are debatable and is beyond, at least my understanding of those tactical issues. But to me, it makes very, it, just to give you an idea, at the Central Australia and the Central Covadonga, where the Castro's mass his truth to move into the Bay of Peak. If we had had control of the air, they could have not amount the forces that they put to move into the Bay of Peak. It would have been impossible for them to, to concentrate and the, the amount of artillery that they were able to place. Therefore, this is a debate forever. But according to these planners, the theory that site could have been capable of holding the beachhead longer. And the idea that it was mentioned, it was not the American intervention. They were seeking a Cuban government on pace in Cuba, the recognition of certain Latin American countries, and then a military participation led by Latin American countries and U.S. forces. Now, that's another debate. But, but you were aware of this yes, junta? Yes, yes, yes. Of this yes, civil junta? Yes. There were more than Before one. Or after? No, there were more than that. There were more than one. <laughs> there, <laughs> there were, yeah, there were several, several, several groups, let's call it groups, where Miro Cardona was head of one and then other dear and good friends were heading others. Actually, there was, was one very brave individual uh, that went with his wife and his dog into Cuba. To be part of a home. To be part of that home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's quite a few. Uh, let me ask you something. You're, you're saying that the, the change was um, change of location was, what, four weeks before? Yes. Mm -hmm. Dean Rusk, who was Secretary of State, the one who, who advised to all of proposed, yes. But how could a civilian, and it could be any of you, how could a civilian be telling the president or the military group of people leading this invasion, I am civilian at this Department of State, advise you or ask you to change the right. location? Number one. Number two, what did the military say to Kennedy? I mean, that to have been a discussion or something that would right. justify changing A to B. Very, 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 two very good questions, my dear. Yeah. Look, first one, the first one, <laughs> the first one. There was a debate of some of high officials saying, let's cancel the operation. It will ruin our image in Latin America, as you were mentioning. Yes. Then, so there were people saying, let's cancel it. Others said, let's give a chance to underground. Let's grow with the underground. But then... Who were these? Could you put that into context? Who were these individuals saying that... Like, for example, was the final Thomas year. Mann was against the landing. Schlesinger was against the landing. Then Dean Ross, it seems to me, that he took, a, okay, let's keep this an old Cuban operation, uh, they use, Dean Ross used the word Trinidad will be too noisy. And so let's go someplace, where le place less noisy than the Bay of Pick. But what did the military In say? The military were enraged. They were enraged. That's I mean, they were like berserk because, first of all, the actual, when they canceled Trinidad, Dean Ross did not offer the, 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 okay, the Bay of Peace. I am trying to dig too much. I think, and I have the, and you can mm -hmm. talk also, 
I, I would imagine that when you are in the, in the center of power like the United States and you're going to change or make a decision as important as changing the location of an, of an invasion, there has to be a certain rigor steps and, and way of, of dealing with... You are imagining something that were not that there. Doesn't work. <laughs> they, they were not there. Actually, actually, when they cancel, and let me make this clear, when they cancel the Trinidad okay. location, they didn't offer an alternative. What did the military they told, say? They told the military, and actually the CIA, they told, find another place. They didn't say, so there you have now. These guys, first of all, specifically, he said, when we were told to cancel the Trinidad operation, our wind went out because where to go. And then after a few days looking at the maps, they came with the idea of, of the Bay of Pig. Could you uh, add a little bit to Brian on this subject? Or what was happening among the civilians while they were deciding what the military was going to do? Um, Maria Vera, the thing, the thing to remember above all is that this was not a military operation. It was a paramilitary operation. It was a supposedly secret, covert operation. And those in charge, the commanders of it, were CIA officers, not, uh, not uniformed military officers. There was, a, there was a, a colonel, his name is Jack Hawkins. He, uh, Jack, Jack is still alive. He lives in Virginia. He's 94 or 95 years old. Uh, Jack was the Pentagon's military advisor at CIA headquarters. And uh, he became progressively more and more angry about, uh, about what was going on, especially after the, the landing location was changed and the, the air raids were, were reduced to almost nothing. But the Secretary of Defense was Robert McNamara. And I'd advise you to look at his, read his memoirs. Uh, he also castigates himself for not having taken a more active role he says, he, he excused himself though, he exonerated himself basically by saying, it was not a military operation. I, I was really not asked to, uh, to become terribly involved. Now the Joint Chiefs of Staff were, were asked for their advice at one point. The President asked Lyman Lemnitzer, he was the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, what do you all think? They went back, uh, the, their response was really remarkable. Uh, they told the President, we think there's a fair chance, a fair chance, that this will succeed. Great. Did Kennedy go back to them and say, what do you mean by a fair chance? Do you mean 40 percent, 20 percent? He never went back and asked them. And Gray said later 30 percent. Yeah. Yes, go. Had a question? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, excellent presentation. Uh, you remember Ben Evans, the executive secretary of the Papa Bush? Mm -hmm. According to his sources, for example, Alan Dulles briefed uh, Kennedy four days before the debate that Kennedy was called. So you were, I mean, that's right on the morning. I don't think, I don't know whether he did it in Palm Beach, but Alan Dulles was told by Eisenhower to go and brief, and you can see this picture of Alan Dulles coming out of it. The point about the chip is very right. Do you remember, or can you find out, when they signed the contract with Marco what? Garcia? When they signed the contract to lease the book, to lease the book with Marco with Garcia Line? The Garcia Line, no. no but I'll, I'll ask Mariano, because Mariano see. signed the contract. That was a fake, that was a fatal yeah, Horrible, horrible. But the control of the air was the basic, basic decision. And what uh, Diego pointed out, according to Ben, then according to my friends in Venezuela, Venezuela had, had offered. The idea was, and that explains why they did activate the underground. The idea was to control the base, get Miro Cardona and the group there. Venezuela was going to move for the recognition of the government and then lead with Venezuelan troops and OAS troops getting into the base. And a final anecdote, <coughs> Alberto Mesa, who was the stenographer of the uh, Estado Mayor de Cuba, 
Then he came into exile <coughs> and worked for Angel Fernández Varela in, uh, in Guadalajara. Alberto told me that when he debriefed the military, the Cuban military, they thought that they were going to lose because the La Línea de Ferrocarril y La Carretera, if we had a control of the air, was a deadly trap. So they were expected to lose. The final point, the 17th of April, was because the mix were coming, but it was also first, Ruchas first day that day. So they thought, no, it's, it's not I just, want, I just want to mention something that happened. We had uh, Khrushchev. We had the opportunity last year of having with us an admiral uh, here of the Southern Command, and he explained uh, what uh, you were mentioning about military or paramilitary, and he says that one of the lessons that they learned was that the Bay of Pig became too large for the CIA to handle. They did not have the capabilities to handle such an operation. And when we, when, when you ask the question that you have, what the military did, they were not military. This was paramilitary operation, and according to, he is right now admiral head of special operations. And he says, one of the lessons Actually, the main lesson was it was too large for the CAA, and we needed to create what they do have now. These, uh, the, the militaries are capable of launching operations like the one where they killed Bisam, Osama bin Laden. These are handled by a special operation from the Army, which in this case, or the Navy, or the Marines. Yeah, just a, uh, an observation. On, uh, 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 one of the consequences of changing the landing size in such a short period of time is, for example, the coral reefs were not identified properly, and and they were not read, and of course that uh, caused the the hazard. I think Eduardo and then the gentleman. Uh, you have Eduardo, you guys have the quote. Well, uh, just wanted to make a couple of comments about. Uh, uh, the reason why they choose the Bay of Peace Invasion is because there is an airport there. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I understand <coughs> it, uh, the idea was to fly from Miami, our Junta, with Miro Cardona uh -huh. as the future exactly. president of Cuba. Uh -huh. And once they were in Cuban territory for three days, that was, that's the, the days that I, I remember. Then they would ask for the government, the, the, the Miro Cardona government uh, with, the, with the other members that would have been in, in Cuban soil for recognition as the legitimate government of Cuba. And once friendly countries which were in the, in, in the know-how like Venezuela and, and all the Central American countries that were, then they would be in a position to give us help, which would be, I mean, I had never heard of three or four weeks that we needed to wait that, that longer time. I thought it was a period of 72 hours after the government had landed at the Bay of Pigs in May. The government in exile that would have been recognized yes. at that time. The gentleman? Knowing the terrain, because there was a guy coming by, uh, the worst place in Cuba to make a landing is the Sienaga de Zapata. That's all. <laughs> good call. Can I ask a quick question? Uh, Come there. If I'm out of order, uh, the one no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I think uh, I'm trying to get to you in one minute. Next. It has been established that the, the whole action and the whole plan was born during the Eisenhower administration. And Eisenhower was the hero of World War II, but also one of the master minds in the United States in terms of the military. The question that comes to my mind is, how was the military changing? I mean, was the military different during the Eisenhower administration when this plan was created 
was he created by by an outstanding military like him that needed no caution by anybody? And where did what support did the people gave him? And then when he when Kennedy became the president, what happened? Did the military change? Well, remember that it was not the military that was involved; it was the CIA that was involved. And I think Pedro yeah, from but, from but the beginning, Hilario. Uh, 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 yeah, from the beginning was a CIA operation. The, the, the from from the beginning, created by a military man. I mean, no, I mean, no, 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 no. no, no. The military. Oh no, you mean Eisenhower? But the the, the the executive order that said to the CIA. You were going to be in charge came from the military head. Yes or not? Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think, but let me okay. I think some clarifications would, would be helpful. Yes. The um, the original plan during the Eisenhower period was for a much smaller operation. It was mostly for guerrilla operations. That's right. And the plan gradually grew into the uh, into the invasion force. The military was the same. The, 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 the chiefs of staff, the joint chiefs of staff, the five of them were the same men from Eisenhower to Kennedy. They all stayed in office. But let me make a couple of other points that are, that are significant, I think, in terms of Kennedy's failures. There was a general, his name was Goodpaster. He was the military advisor to Eisenhower in the White House when Eisenhower was president. And Kennedy kept General Goodpaster in his National Security Council after he took office. He never asked General Goodpaster for advice about the Bay of Pigs. He cut him out because it was a covert action. Kennedy thought this general had no need to know. General Eisenhower was retired, living at his farm in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, two hours from Washington. Uh, and he was regularly in touch with, uh, with CIA officials. He got regular briefings. Did Kennedy or Goodpaster or anybody in the White House call or contact General Eisenhower and ask for his advice about the Bay of Pigs? Oh, but there was a meeting. There no. was a meeting between no, Kennedy no. and Eisenhower, right? That was not But, but the four, the later. During, the, during the transition. Let, let me get this gentleman here, the Calarberto. But let me finish with his thought. So how, what, what do you take out of that? The fact that he never called Eisenhower, the fact that he never talked to the pastor. What do you read out of that? Uh, Anyone was... know? Don't confuse me with the facts. Sorry? That Kennedy what, didn't really no. want to know. He didn't want to be confused with the facts. No, the best and the brightest. They didn't need to be. Well, yeah, I, mean, I, you know, I think the answer would probably have many layers, and it yes. would be it would be very complicated. It would. What, what, it, it what would, would be your analysis? Your well, point I, mean, I, I don't know the answer, but I think it would I think it would rest partly on the the, the strained relationship between Kennedy and Eisenhower. Uh, I think it uh, I think it would have reflected Jack Kennedy's hubris. That uh, he he believed that this would work, and why did he why did he think? And, and this is, I think this is really a very important point yeah. to make. Right. Kennedy and Dick Bissell shared the ultimate of the secrets of the Bay of Pigs. They believed that when you all landed on the beaches, Fidel Castro would be dead. There was a mafia assassination plot that the CIA was running that Richard Bissell had authorized. And there was, a, there was a Cuban who supposedly received poison pills that were manufactured in the CIA, and these were to be put in Castro's food or drink by this man, this Cuban, who worked, <coughs> supposedly worked in a restaurant that Castro frequented. The mafia and the CIA were very confident that Castro was going to be poisoned, that by the time you landed on the beaches, there would have been chaos in the command and control structure of the Cuban armed forces. There would have been a, maybe even a popular uprising. And the government in exile on the beach would have had a much better chance of, um, of surviving. The assassination of Castro was the critical and most secret component of the plan. Okay, I know that's going to open up a whole series of, of, of questions, but let me try to get to some people that I've been trying to get to first. Why did Thank you. Fail? Forgive the unfairness of the question, but could the panelists please speculate, if possible, what would have been the outcome of the Bay of Pigs had Nixon won the election? You all would uh, be in power in Cuba, and Fidel Castro would be gone. Carlos <laughs> Alberto. No, I want to, to add to that. Uh, Nixon had uh, been. Uh, 
something that was very important for the failure. It was the previous success of Guatemala. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. The same people that made the plans in, for Guatemala made the plan for Sayopic. And they were under the impression that Guatemala and Cuba are more or less the same thing. And that's... That's right. Yep. That's All right. Plus. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> He said, he, 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 he said that you didn't understand his question. What we we did perfectly. That, that it was eh? a, the, the wrong place. An oh. you I, make, I thought he was just making a statement. You make a statement, a statement of fact. The scale of Sabata shows it for the... Uh, the no, fool. no, it was a terrible landing site. It was a terrible landing site. And, but, but they were given just a four weeks to really replan this thing, and that's what they came up with. I, I don't know. Exactly. They were not in south in southern Cuba. There are not too many suitable landing areas uh, outside Casilda or the or, or the Bay of Pigs. There are not that many. You could you might go to Sibone in Oriente, which would have been a, a great place. For the second time, let me let me go here, and then I'll go here and back there. Uh, three complements are added. Have you read about the ninth plane? The, the, in the first bombardment, there was a uh spontaneous. -huh. Have you read about that one? In the first bombardment, there was a Cuban pilot, one of the Cuban pilots, that was patrolling Santiago de Cuba. And he saw the bombardment. He said, Los Americanos están aquí. And he, this is on the record, so you can check it. He landed in, in Jamaica. And unbeknownst to anybody, he gave the same story of the people that had to land in, in, in Homestead because they, don't have, they didn't have fuel. Those, those planes that were not. I was not aware of that. It's a nice plane. And I, I was asked. Actually. I don't know. I don't know about that guy. Before the, the killing, there was a plot by the CIA to poison Fidel so he would lose his. In the restaurant botin, I mean they had a, they had a contact in botin that, that was supposed to, to be. So those, those are, the, those are well, the nice pilot is, is also in that. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that, sir. No. Um, thank you for having the presentation. My cousin Juan Clark was in the invasion, mm -hmm. and I spent uh, four or five months traveling through Cuba a few years ago. But my question is, if the invasion was successful, um, were the institutions in place and was would there have been a Cuban leadership, what would have happened if the invasion was successful? Do you think they would have reinstated the 1940 Constitution? Do you think there would have been democracy? Um, if they had won militarily, what do you think would have happened? I, Go ahead. I believe that the persons that were chosen at the time, their pedigree on respect of freedoms, uh, the judicial independence uh, as a power, etc. They were good people. You have Tony Varona with a long and extensive uh, background as a fighter and, and as a, uh, you have a, a group of them. And then do you have the younger ones uh, which were also very much committed uh, to, to this, to this. Uh, so I do believe that at least they, they will have done a good tryout. Now, could we handle our Cuban <laughs> family? I will ask Carlos Alberto to answer, <laughs> to answer that question. I'm joking, Carlos. <laughs> we have one more question. Up here. Okay. I just wanted to say, point out something quickly. Uh, there's a real temptation always to downplay the ability of the brigade. In reality, the brigade was not just 1,500 men. It was a total of 3,068 men. Yeah. And they had a total of eight ships. In reality, the capacity of the brigade, if they had landed with air cover to hold down the Cuban land, was a lot better than even the American military men given credit for. In two ships alone, the Atlantic and the Caribe, they had enough weapons, ammunition, spare parts, and fuel for an army of 10,000 men to fight nonstop for three weeks. In the Blagar and Barbara Jota, 
which were the only two ships that were able to land their weapons and ammunition, the entire brigade of 1,500 men in land were able to fight nonstop for three days without running out of ammunition. In the Houston and in Escondido, they had enough weapons and ammunition for an entire brigade, 3,068 men, to fight for three weeks nonstop. And that doesn't count the Lake Charles, which was coming in with the military police and the, and the intelligence police, and all the military uh, brass for the medical corps, and the Santa Ana ship, which was the one that the lady over there mentioned, which was a diversionary effort in the Oriente province with 150 men, and another ship for three weeks more fighting. So the brigade had it landed, it would have lasted a lot longer, even without the so-called help of the OAS or the Latin American armies, or even the United States Army. They had enough to last well over three weeks fighting. Had they, the air cover been there. That is very good. Any other questions? One, one more, one more question. Thank you for the uh, information, the panel. The fact is that Fidel and his forces appear to have been uh, advised that there was a, a forthcoming invasion. And they went ahead and put all these young kids in jail, and, and there was already movement of troops and, and tanks in Cuba before the invasion got there. So it's possible, is it possible that the United States government, i.e., I, I, uh, Jack Kennedy would allow that to happen, be about advising uh, Fidel Castro and his forces on this, you know, because no. it behooved the Americans to do that, and it was in their favor, and they, because Fidel was ready. Well, uh, there was really not a secret, and obviously the brigade had been penetrated by, by Cuban agents at that point. So, sir? I know that, but... Very good presentation. First of all, it looks like uh, a bunch of crazy Cubans induced by the CIA, gathered a way to... Hernandez Cartagena is a veteran of the Bay of Pink and landed actually from uh, before it blew. The, the your ship was the Rio Condido. Rio Condido. But however, I think nobody has said anything about it. Not the CIA, not Dr. Rassel, not Dr. Roy. That this was a concerted effort that was done with the Cuban Revolutionary Council which brought together all the exile community into one group, of which Dr. Mirocadora was the president, and Dr. Barona, and a lot of other people that were very prominent people. So this was not just a crazy situation. It was a concerted situation, and they had direct access to the Kennedy White House, constantly. Maybe you didn't know about it, but that's the fact. Thank I'm you. Not going to say anything else. By the way, Fernando Cartaya was, Cartaya was, was also also in the a treasurer of the Movimiento de Recuperación Revolucionaria at the time. So thank you. And thank you.